Welcome to today's GEMS virtual lecture. GEMS is the gateway to early modern manuscript sermons, and I'm Jennifer Fruit, the research associate for GEMS. For those of you who don't know, GEMS is a freely accessible online bibliographic database of manuscript sermons from 1530 to 1715. The database currently includes records for sermon manuscripts from over 80 repositories, so libraries and archives um, in the UK and North America. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Catherine Evans, who is a Leverhulme Research Fellow at the University of Manchester. She works on religious literature from the mid 16th to late 17th centuries and has a particular interest in devotional poetry, sermon culture, and book history. Her current project looks at how reflective materials played a part in 17th century Protestant devotion. Catherine has been a researcher for GEM since 2018, and she has found lots of fascinating things um, for us in the archives. Catherine is going to be talking to us today about manuscript sermons, letters, and poetry. I'll pass things over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much for the introduction, Jennifer, and I can only apologize again for the two times where I was failed by technology um, and yeah, so failed to deliver this um, talk, sweet words and lasting monuments. Um, manuscript sermons, letters and poetry. Um, I was going to say in person, but no, on online. Um, part of this, um, this, this paper is sort of work in progress and part of it is um, a, an sort of feeding into an article that I'm working on at the moment, um, particularly the sort of latter part on John Dunn and Joseph Hall. So if you do have any questions, please do reach out to me um, by email, um, as I was really disappointed not to get the chance to hear from the GEMS audience, which I know is always so engaged and knowledgeable. And for that reason, to me, a often a little scary because of the sort of breadth of knowledge is out, that is out there. Um, so I would really, really appreciate if you do have any questions, do send them to me by email. Um, I would love to discuss this or <laughs> really probably not discuss, just learn from, learn from, um, learn from you all. But um, yeah, I'll just get started with the presentation. So on February the 18th, 1682, an Essex clothier, Joseph Bufton would pen his own verse I made for the Sabbath, um, which you can see here um, with my very ugly fingernail poking in the corner, um, which gives you a sense of just how tiny this, um, this volume is. So the poem reads, this is the Sabbath day, it is now again returned once more, let me not trifle it away, though I of them enjoy great store. Most precious are, they all indeed. They let um, them let me well improve all ways. They pass away with speed. So I'm not going to make any claims of this being the best piece of poetry you've ever read, or indeed probably the best piece of poetry you've read today. But I do think it's a really fascinating insight into the literary culture of a man of very meager means and the sort of person whose literary work we rarely have any glimpses of. Bufton was a cloth, work, cloth worker, born in Coggeshall, Essex in 1651, and he would spend his whole life working nearby um, until he died at Castle Henningham in 1718. He was a strict, skilled tradesman who never uh, married, seemed to spend the early years of his life working for his father and left no issue. But what he did leave behind, however, 22 almanacs, which over 40 years he filled with, to use his own words, was things taken out of other books and notes of sermons as well as his own extensive records of the local area, um, including a volume that was filled with burial and marriages um, and his sort of yearly account of remarkable things. So we have um, about half of his, his, his output, 11 of his notebooks, many of them almanacs, almanacs with the blanks filled in. Three of these are held in the Brotherton Library at the University of Leeds, um, although these don't contain sermons, but you can view them online in full digital copy, copies, and eight in the Essex Record Office. Um, Bufton's more kind of historical writings have been dis discussed in two articles by Brodie Waddell, um, considering him in terms of writing history from below. 
But I'm really interested in his relationship to literary texts. So as you can um, hopefully see in this um, in this slide, his po this poem is um, inspired um, by some verses that he copied out from Herbert Sunday, also seen on this flyleaf, um, which he, he titles The Privilege of Enjoying Sabbath. One of our English poets doth um, no less piously than ingeniously set forth. Um, and he titles his own poem, A Verse I Made for the Sabbath, um, like these that are that here on this cover. So Buffett is kind of thinking, you know, this text is a text that's really linked to the Sabbath. And he has been, he's not only kind of collecting other literary sources, he's then using it to sort of spark his own work. Um, in another of his poems, um, written in a, an almanac um, found at the Brotherton Library, he links the transience of human life to the transience of text. And you can see it's just written in the kind of central, um, this sort of small gap um, between two sets of texts um, horizontally across the, across the text um, in the middle there. Um, so he writes, an almanac is but for one year, and then tis out of date. And every year some men depart and leave this mortal state. That year which is to some the first, to others is the last. And all our time is short, our years are quickly passed. So Buffton's quickly passing years and the swiftly passing sermons that he heard were, however, should and preserved in this written form, even if it is really in these, you know, not even margins, the kind of gutters of these little almanacs that he kept. So the idea of the temporality of the sermon text, and I suppose text more generally, will flow through this presentation. Working with manuscript sermons has made me think about the complexities of the relationship between text and performance. How sermons in their textual form, be that manuscript or print, might make up for the lack of the preacher's voice, the lack of the kind of performative moment. And also the, um, the ability that these um, textual sermons gave, and um, the opportunity, I should say, for lay people to add to them, um, if you've got a sermon written down, it means it can be read out loud by somebody else. It means it can be studied deeply. Um, lay people can summarise them at will or use them as spurs of poetic creation. So I'm just going to start by discussing some poetry found in a few sermon manuscripts. And then I'm going to move to thinking about the relationship between letters and sermon texts. And particularly the relationship of the written sermon to the performed sermon. Particularly the ways in which the space in which the um, sermon as performed might relate to the textual space of the sermon itself. Um, and I'm going to look particularly at two sermons and their sort of accompanying letters by Joseph Hall and John Donne. But for now, let's stick with Bufton. Bufton seems to have had a deeply impressive recall of the sermons that he'd heard. In one entry, he notes that on the 10th of June, 1697, Mr. Boyes preached at Edward Miles's funeral from Colossians um, 3... 32, um, th sorry, 3-3. Th three, three. But his sermon was the same with the two sermons he preached from that text on Sunday, May 14th, 1682. So despite the fan, span sorry, of 15 years, Bufton recognises the substance of John Boyce's sermon. His extensive note-taking practices may have resulted in a particularly effective recall system. As Arnold Hunt um, has pointed out, the techniques of hearing which enabled the proper reception of sermons were heavily dependent on literacy skills, presupposing a listener who could handle a pen and take notes in the sermon as an aid to memory. Um, I'm sort of the same. I have to write things down as I'm listening to them in order to be able to take them in properly. And so visualizing the structure of a sermon on the page was the best way to understand the heard word. Um, Bufton does more than simply record sermons. Um, he acts as an editor and combines um, sermons which treat the same text and digest them down to their salient facts. Um, and this is perhaps most clear um, in the text of his that I've, I've explored. Sorry. Um, there we go, sorry. Um, this is perhaps most clear in um, the Essex Record Office, D, 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 M, Z, A, um, which I put the, gen the, sorry, the GEMS entry the gentry um, for here. Um, this contains several summaries of sermons preached by John Boys from 1680 to 1687. Um, but what Bufton has done is he collects together several sermons on the same text preached in a single year, and then creates sort of 14 of his own texts, his own kind of 
um, what would you call them? I guess a kind of like sermon amalgamation, sermon, um, so that sermon mashup perhaps. Um, this notebook was dated April 21st, 1690. So, um, so this process has taken, you know, over 10 years. We can maybe surmise that Bufton has copied and perhaps in terms used by John Donne when describing his own sermon writing practices, probated, recreated and post-created the sermons. In doing so, Bufton has also been spurred for his own act of literary creation. This tiny volume opens with a 14 stanza po um, poem. Each stanza describing the meat of these sort of mashup sermons um, and, he, he just, and describing the good things that are written in this little book. So for each of these, in each of these poems, um, Bufton identifies who the best audience for the sermon would be, um, with ones that were perhaps aimed at the older people, married persons, or parents on whom God has with children's blessed. Um, and one of these poems, sort of summarizing um, sermon on Ezekiel 33, 11, um, almost seems to cast aspersions on the efficacy of preaching. The next door to his, the next sorry, the next dis, the next discourse to his his doth prove most plain. Men rise from the dead to be in vain. Such small successes would all their preaching gain. Christ, when on earth he was despised um, and slated, if men will still refuse, who are invited, Christ's mercy to accept, they will not be persuaded. Although one from the dead they see, this argument with other things beside doth this discourse set forth. Um, we may confide in God's own words to the, who to this purpose spake, um, the gospel of ministry, let us not forsake. Um, so this mashup sermon is made up of the notes of five of the 12 sermons that Mr. Boyes pre um, preached in the year 1687 on Ezekiel 33, 11. Um, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, um, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So both the um, resurrection of the dead and even their potentially preaching may still not um, be enough to reach everybody who would hear this um, sermon or um, experience what is kind of described in the sermon. Um, he, he gives us evidence of the fact that um, Christ himself was refused on earth. And in the sermon, um, in, in this poem, I think he's kind of giving this call to remain resolute despite this. I really want to spend a bit more time looking at these, um, these poems that um, Bufton has written and looking at the way in which he's created these sort of sermon mashups. I also need to find a better term for it than that. So if anyone um, has any suggestions, I think there probably is a there is probably a pre-existing term. Um, do let me know. But now to move on to another manuscript. Um, this one, which is held in again, this is the Gems um, entry, commonplace book now held at the UCLA Clark Library, which was jointly written by Anne Lay and her husband Roger Lay. Um, the curate of St. Leonard's um, Shoreditch from 1623 to 1667. Um, St. Leonard's Shoreditch has been sort of long um, destroyed. Actually, no, I think it's the, the form that it was in then was destroyed, um, but I think it does still exist in some ways. But it was kind of known as the, um, it's known now as the, the Actors Church because it has the graves of um, um, the burial places of lots of kind of Shakespearean actors from the period. So um, in this commonplace book, as well as sermons by Lay, um, extracts from Joseph Hall's meditations, um, letters um, and elegies, there are also a number of poems, including two um, by Anne Lay, which are sort of poetic interpretations of sermons. Um, so um, both of which are, um, appear in a sort of um, two page spread, um, first of which is um, entitled On a Sermon Preached at the Church of St. Leonard's Shoreditch. Um, by Mr. John Linney on the subject of patience and affliction. Sorry. So it opens, sweet words which like the dew of heaven fell, 
On those dry hearts, scorched by the burning flames of fierce afflictions, able to repel the sharpest dart which angry spite can frame. So this sermon offers a counter to the deepest um, drafts of sorrow by arguing that suffering might be a sign of love from God rather than hate. Um, Lay writes, as a, a, as a servant and son offend alike, and yet the son does the greater stripes receive. So Lay compares the preacher to a second Barnabas, whose rare discourse did full of comfort flow, and also to the psalmist David, writing, this lofty strain he skillfully did sing, like David's music able to essay this greatest frenzy, and be their guide and stay in this world's pilgrimage through which he must walk craggy paths and many storms endure. Um, and then sort of overleaf. Um, so it kind of not only sort of shows the strength of the sermon, um, but then kind of finishes with this um, sort of short stanza um, at the top of the next page, um, sort of talking a bit more about the, about the preacher, saying many such sermons, may he um, live to preach, um, let happiness be forth in him and his attend. Um, and then below that, there's this acrostic um, upon um, John Squire's name. I hope you can see the sort of acrostic form down the side. So John Squire would later deliver Anne Lay's funeral sermon, which is included in this manuscript and presumably written in by her husband. Um, and this is a, a, upon a sermon preached in St Paul's Church upon the Second Commandment, um, January 6th, 1623. Um, and this is quite, it's quite a, quite an interesting little, little poem. I think I particularly like the rhyme at the end of the first two lines of Papist C um, with Rome's gross idolatry. Um, but what I want to draw attention to is the sort of dual emphasis in these two poems um, upon both sight and sound. So the sermon, the, the preacher was talked about in terms of the Psalmist David in the previous poem, and is perhaps conjured up again in this acrostic with references to sweet are the streams, um, quickening those droop drooping souls. I think kind of both medicinal and also musical imagery. But here with the acrostic, Lay is really emphasizing the written form of the sermon towards the end, writing, read with a humble heart, it is worth your pain. Every sentence have its, have its weight, no word in vain. So this is a poem which really only makes sense in its visual form. You know, the acrostic needs to be seen rather than the red, than red so you can kind of understand the, um, the wordplay that is happening. And even the fact that the, the sort of J, um, you know, this, the fact that J and I are the same in written form here. So unless it's supposed to begin Jin, I think it's in this blessed labour, um, the poem begins. You wouldn't understand that this, you can only really understand this poem if you see it written down and you're um, and you're reading it. Um, so it's a poem which is talking about the process of reading a sermon um, in a form that you really have to see upon the page. So the question of how writing and speech related to one another and which held the group greater truth value is of course a really enduring one. Um, particularly the question of whether writing or the voice is more emotive. And it's this sort of question of the relationship between the oral and the, um, you know, the oral, oral, um, the written, the printed, is of course particularly thorny when discussing sermons. As Thomas Webster and Arnold Hunt have explored, Protestant culture was intensely phonological, with the spoken word associated with self-presence, truth, authenticity, and an immediate and transparent movement of meaning. Consequently, the physical record of a spoken performance, print or manuscript sermon, lacked some of this authenticity and this ability to provide meaning. And clerics and lay people alike debated whether the ear, the, uh, or the eye, speech or writing was a more effective way to experience devotion. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna discuss the works of Joseph Hall and John Donne, specifically thinking about how they use metaphors of enclosure to interweave materiality and voice in their sermons. And I'm going to explore how they use letters to shape responses and insert themselves into textual copies of performances. So, in his late 30s, when he was preacher at Lincoln's Inn, John Dunn sent a copy of one of his sermons to Susan Vere, the Countess of Montgomery. Mont Mont 
Um, in, in the accompanying letter, he declared, oh, sorry, that was a close-up of the, um, of the acrostic. I should have put that up before. Um, so in the accompanying letter, he declared, in writing the sermon which your ladyship was pleased to hear before, I confess I satisfy an ambition of my own, an ambition of leaving my name in the memory or in the cabinet. So this brief passage illuminates the complex status of the sermon in early modern literary culture. Existing, um, oh, sorry, that is the wrong slide up as well. Um, um, this is, that's for the next sort of section. I obviously don't have, haven't got a picture of this, this quote, but I will come back to it multiple times, so um, do not despair. Um, so this brief passage illuminates the complex status of the sermon in early modern literary culture, existing simultaneously as performance, as textual object, be that in manuscript or print, and as a token of the preacher's identity. identity. So Dunn envisages his sermon acting as an emissary within his prospective patron's home, held close in his lady's cabinet to remind her of him. This motif of the sermon being held within a lady's cabinet is a common one in the period, with similar language appearing in the prefatory letters to Joseph Hall's 1623 sermon preached at the happily restored and re-edified Chapel of St. John's, um, which is up here already, in which he beseeches, this sermon craves a place, though unworthy, in your cabinet, um, in your heart. So it makes this, um, this sort of... Um, this letter that precedes the sermon makes use of the metaphor of the building to examine the relationship between the printed and spoken sermon. Um, he writes, um, this sermon I know is at the press before you expected, but I thought as this glorious chapel occasioned it, so it might minister occasion of perpetual rem remembrance of the chapel by remaining its first monument. And although both these were confirmed to the private, the chapel for the family of my right honorable Lord, the Earl of Exeter, who has given them material thereof sufficient luster and a copy of the sermon to the cabinet of my truly noble and virtuous lady, his countess. Yet both of these are much and oft required to the public, the sermon to be an instruction, and so it is, the chapel to be an example, and so it may be. The sermon to teach all to be all glorious in their souls, the chapel to teach some who build houses for their own habitation, to set up another God's religion. So this creates striking architectural conceit, contrasting the private space of Hall's Lady's Cabinet, in which the copied um, um, manuscript sermon was kept to the chapel itself, while the printed sermon becomes a public monument. The cabinet is both a space in which the letter and sermon can be held close and revealed, and yet has none of the veracity of the spoken word. This apology almost constitutes a rebuke against the building of the chapel. Although it is glorious and lustrous, it is inaccessible, inaccessible, confined to private. The aim of the sermon to instruct all to be glorious in their souls is obviously more expansive and worthy than the lesson that we've drawn from the chapel, reminding those building new houses to create a space for religious worship. Despite this, the sermon is framed as acting as a monument um, to the chapel itself. So the um, Loki um, technique beloved by Renaissance humanists has been reversed with the text enabling perpetual remembrance of a space. Um, so the frontispiece, um, interestingly, of the sermon, you know, looks like a chapel itself. Um, and as a little, little side and a bit of self-publicity, if you're interested in sermon um, title pages, um, I had an article recently come out in the library looking at kind of um, printed sermon title pages and what they might tell us about the early modern book market. Um, but to sort of move on from that self of publicity um, to Glorious Chapel itself. Um, this was the happily restored and re-edified chapel, um, to use Hall's words, of St. John's in, of Jerusalem, in which both Dunn and Hall preached in 1623, as it had just been remodelled and generally spruced up by its new owners, William um, Cecil, the second Earl of Exeter, the grandson of the better known first Baron Burley of the same name, and his second wife, Elizabeth Drury. So this chapel had been through a plethora of changes over the centuries. Um, it was located on the old site of the Priory, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. Um, the first church there had been built in um, between 11, 1144 and 1164, um, Round Nave Church, um, due to a brief vogue for Round Nave churches, started by Crusaders coming back from Jerusalem, where they'd seen the Anastasis Rotunda in the... Um, Holy Sepulchre um, Church. A few images here of a sort of um, still remaining round church in Cambridge 
um, and some of the kind of, and the sort of the dome space in the Holy Sepulchre, which has kind of been knocked down and rebuilt um, so many times over the centuries, I can't sort of get into, into it here. But this was kind of the initial model for the, the first church um, in this um, space in Clerkenwell. However, it was um, rebuilt 100 years later in the 12, um, 1280s in a rectangular shape. And then 100 years after that was then burnt down and rebuilt again. Over the centuries, the order grew more and more wealthy. Um, and sort of 60 years before the dissolution um, saw, saw um, it become essentially a sort of palace um, with extensive lands. So Henry VIII seized this valuable land, but instead of destroying the church and priory, he used them as a storehouse of the king's toil and tents for hunting and the wars. When Edward ascended, the church, including the great bell tower, um, and most curious, um, and here I'm quoting from Fuller's kind of history of London, the great bell tower, a most curious piece of workmanship, graven and gilt and enameled to the great beautifying of the city, was undermined and blown up, and the stone used to um, build the Lord Protector's house on the Strand. Stowe reports how other elements of the church were moved to new homes, with a fair stone per cat porch, bell frame, and one church bell placed at, all, placed at All Hallows, Lombard Street. So this kind of church was kind of cannibalised and then um, used to build kind of other churches around London. But some of the extensive com complex remained, and Mary I would make the priory her London home before her, before her ascension, and when she took the throne, had the order of um, St John re-established. But once Elizabeth's reign began, the priory was again um, confiscated and the order suppressed. And then the old priory passed through several hands, eventually being purchased by William Cecil and Elizabeth Drury, who began their own programme of building. Um, resulting in um, in something like this, these sort of images that we see from um, Wenceslas Holler. Um, so Fuller writes that Elizabeth Drury was very forward to repair the ruined choir of St. John's. They were corrugated, corrugated having the side aisle excluded, yet so their upper part is omitted, affording conveniences for attention. It's one of the best private chapels in England, discreetly embracing the means of decency betwixt the extremes of slovenly profaneness and gaudy superstition. Um, so this chapel, as I hope you see for that kind of whistle-stop tour, like so many English post-Reformation religious buildings, had been through a dizzying array of architectural reformations. As buildings, particularly religious buildings, are rebuilt and changed, they become imbued with these further layers of signification, demonstrating both the potential of new religions to overwrite the old and the tenacity of the old to persevere um, through this reworking. So um, Hall and Dunning just to kind of consider this history of the building as they as they kind of performed sermons within this space that paid attention to the um paid attention to its history. Both Hall and Dan, um, I'm sure, as I'm sure you know, have been intimately connected with um, the Drury family since the early 20s. Hall had worked for Elizabeth's brother, Sir Robert Drury, and was personally selected by her brother, sister-in-law, Lady Anne Bacon Drury, as preacher at Horsted. Um, and Hall explicitly cites this connection in the sermon's prefatory letter, addressed to Elizabeth declaring, for me, your honour may justly challenge me on both sides, both by the Drury's in the right of that first patronage and by the Cecil's in the right of my succeeding devotions. Um, although this kind of allied some, some kind of, some bad blood maybe but, um, with Hall and the Drury's. Hall had often complained about the meagerness of his stipend during that first patronage and ultimately, ultimately leaving Robert Drury's employ in a bit of a huff take on a more prestigious and hopefully better remunerated role as a chaplain in Hen Prince Henry's court. The Cecils were a family of architectural mavericks whose building projects irreversibly shape um, English architecture. Nearby um, St John's in Clerkenwell, they completely sort of rebuilt the Strand, creating new homes and commercial buildings. And they also constructed um, three of the country's most noted prodigy houses um, in two generations, Burley, Theobalds and Hatfield House, pictured here. Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury, and the uncle of the William Cecil that I've been discussing, um, had come under fire for the decoration of the chapel in Hatfield House, which had been consecrated um, a little over a decade ago um, in 1612. Um, in a lavishly decorated house, the chapel is particularly ornate, a riot of colour and image. 
Um, stained glass windows depicted scenes in the Old Testament and the walls were adorned with paintings, um, as you can see here, of New Testament prophets and apostles. The chapel's decoration was controversial, despite attempting to update pre-Reformation decorative style for high church Protestants. So considering the architectural splendor which had become associated with the, um, the Cecil family, Paul's opening the sermon is perhaps particularly apt. He writes, as we have houses of our own, so God hath his. Yet as great men have more houses than one, so hath the greatest God of heaven much more, more both in succession and in variety. So I like to imagine if I'm knowing smirk growing around the ch chapel as Hall comments on the number of houses which great men might lay claim to. Indeed, it's worth noting that private general, sorry, private chapels in general could be looked upon suspiciously. In a 1614 sermon, um, John Bowell, the one-time chaplain to Robert Cecil, um, declared that whilst God giveth that blessing the public temple, that he doth not give to a private chapel. Indeed, they are chapels of ease, more for their ease than for their honour. As though we can cannot adore the God of heaven, except be, be attended like um, Berenice with pomp on earth. So this idea that maybe the gentry were just building these chapels to make it easy for them. They don't have to travel so far. It's a more beautiful space. They get to show off. You know, there is are these concerns around private chapels. So while Fuller um, in his history of, um, of London declared that the chapel in Clerkenwell um, discreetly embraced the mean of decency between between twixt slovenly profaneness and gaudy superstition, Paul's praise is extremely measured, if not slightly dismissive. He takes as his text um, Haggai 2.9, the glory of this latter house should be greater than that of the former, um, saith the Lord's of host. And in this piece, this place, sorry, I will give peace. So Hall um, repeatedly asserts that architecture is inconsequential, um, beginning with um, God's words to David. He dwells not in temples made with hands. He then draws on the examples that long live um, the Temple of Solomon and the Jewish temple, white marble without lime with gold within, brazen pillars. And he sets up a clear comparison with the setting for this sermon. Um, in this sort of newly re rebuilt, um, re-edified um, chapel at St. John's in Clerkenwell, saying, um, imagine the altar never so gay, the imagery never so curious, the vestments, the vestments never so rich, the pillars, walls, windows, pavement never so exquisite. Yet I dare boldly say this present glory of this house in this comely whiteness and well-contrived corruption is greater than the former. So the spectre of the pre-Reformation chapel is conjured um, as Hall praises the architectural simplicity of this redesigned one, moving from an imagined space characterized by ornamentation to one that is notable for its simplicity and whiteness. And um, 20 years after Hall spoke in St. John's, the controversial decoration in the chapel at Hatfield House would be partially erased with accounts showing that in 1644, a pound eight shillings was spent on putting out the painting and making the roof fair white. But throughout this, um, this sermon, Hall is grappling with a thorny topic. Was the church itself a sacred place? Um, Richard Hooker had rehabilitated the theology of consecration um, in 1597. However, there was continued debate. Um, the doctrine of divine omnipresence, God is everywhere, is necessarily complicated by an insistence upon the sacred nature of the church, God is specifically here. Believing that the church was the space of the divine could be construed as papist or superstitious. The homilies gave the moderate argument that churches were hallowed because God's people were sorting them there and too holy um, and, ex and exercised themselves in holy and heavenly things. But that God could not be enclosed in temples or houses made with man's hand. So God attributes the holiness of the chapel, not the consecration of sermon ceremony itself, but by testification of presence, as seen in Matthew 18.20. He declares, what care I, nay, what care God for the work of a lapidary, painter or mason? One zealous prayer, one orthodox sermon is a more glorious furniture than all the precious rarities and mechanic excellencies. Um, but this focus on usage rather than the material did not entirely sidestep discord. It was a central um, position of the sermon itself held in church practice in England in the early 17th century was controversial. As Hunt has written, whether reading the Bible or hearing, 
sermons was more was a more effective route to godliness it had far-reaching and complex implications with the views held by different confessional groups contradicting and coinciding with one another in surprising ways in hunt's terms the puritan position that reading was insufficient without preaching came dangerously close to the roman catholic position that scripture was insufficient without tradition um, as conformists often pointed out but i'm now just going to turn to spaces of enclosure in dunn's writing so the motif of the ladies cabinet as a space to both contain and disclose is seen in a letter um, that Dunn sent to the Countess of Montgom Montgomery, um, Susan Vere with the sermon. So Dunn declares, in writing the sermon, which your ladyship was pleased to hear before, I confess I satisfy an ambition of my own, which is the ambition of obeying your commandment, not only an ambition of leaving my name in the memory or in the cabinet. Um, and yet, since I'm going out of the kingdom and perchance out of the world, when God shall have given my place, my soul a place in heaven, it shall the less diminish your ladyship if my poor name be found about you. So as in Mr. Hall's prefatory printed sermon to the re-edification sermon, Dunn characterised the letter as something to be held close and something which the ladies let very presence imbues with value. In this self-effacing move, he acknowledges the public nature of the cabinet. His name could be discovered um, even when concealed within it by readers. So the cabinet is both a space in which the letter and sermon can be held close and revealed, but it has none of the vivacity of the spoken word. Um, and it's important to note at the time that a cabinet could be either a piece of um, movable furniture um, used to store valuable possessions or a semi-private um, room within an aristocratic household. And indeed, a lady's cabinet could perhaps be both simultaneously, so it could be a chest within a private room, a cabinet within a, um, within a cabinet. Um, and this is sort of one such um one such kind of closet or cabinet that might be known to Paul and Dunn, the painted um cabinet of Lady Anne Bacon Drury, their early early, early patron. So a closet or a cabinet is a notionally private space, but the solitude that it purports to offer is often pierced by the outside world. Um and the complex decorative scheme, for instance, of Lady Drury's closet pictured here suggested as much a space of visitors as it was a private contemplation. Um, but returning to um, to Dunn's letter to the Countess of Montgomery, he explicitly links the letter and the sermon to his own identity. So Dunn hopes that the written form of his name will ensure that he's remembered. Um, and it's the fact that a kind of a written word physically lasts um, is, is what is important in his absence. The question about which sermon this letter has accompanied though, uh, has been a sort of debated one. So a manuscript copy of this letter appears in both the um, Dobell and Merton manuscripts prefixed to Dunn's sermons on Matthew um, 21, 44. But the letter also appears in a single leaf manuscript, seemingly torn from a choir with one jagged edge um, in Cheshire Record Office. Um, in this copy, which I wish I had a picture of, um, and I'm, I'm gonna get one soon, hopefully, the letter takes up the bottom two thirds of the leaf and is copied in an italic band. At the top of the letter sits the end, the end of a sermon by an unknown preacher in secretary hand. And this leaf has at one point been folded into ninths. Um, Dennis um, Flynn has speculated that it might have been torn from a choir and then folded to be included within another letter. So a copy of a letter within a letter then. And this copy of the letter contains a note that the original letter, so I'm saying the letter works so many times, the word letters so many times, originally accompanied a sermon on Ecclesiastes 12.1. Um, Dunn's famous valediction sermon given Lincoln's Inn, Lincoln's Inn on 18, the 18th of April, 1619, when Ecclesiastes um, 12, 11, 1, sorry, as I said, delivered before he left Germ Germany. This would concord with the matter of the letter. As Dunn says, um, he will be out of the kingdom um, and perhaps out of this world. The letter was later printed in Dunn's 1651, Letters to Persons of Honour. Um, I think it's kind of this interesting thing about letters, the way in which they can circulate attached, um, even when they seem so specific, they kind of address certain people. They're moved around, they're anthologized, they appear in these different forms. So like a sermon, letters are often presented as a means to physically capture a voice. Indeed, more than just a voice, Dunn's letters make claims for their ability to in intermingle souls. Writing to Henry Goodyear, he declares that the writing of letters, when it is with any seriousness, is a kind of ecstasy, 
in a departure, in a succession, in suspension of the soul, which doth then complicate itself to two bodies. As Rami Targoff, Elaine Scarry, and Lucy Rizal have all noted, Verdun letter writing was an act of poetic possibility, a means of bringing together souls separated by distance. And this sort of febrile created atmosphere, the physicality of the letter makes language helpfully, um, promisingly material. So Dunn's letter to the Countess of uh, Montgomery examines both the sermon and the letter, um, metaphysically, and here I sort of give a bit, a bit more quote from it. Um, he writes, in one circumstance, my preaching and writing the sermon is too equal, that that that, that, that your lord, lady heard in a hoarse voice then, you read in a coarse hand now. But in thankfulness, I shall lift up my hands as clean as my infirmities can keep them, and the voice as clear as the spirit shall be pleased to tune in my prayers, your lady, in all the places of the world, which shall either sustain or bury. So the performance of the sermon, his croaking voice, is linked to the physical appearance of the letter with its scrawled writing. In emphasising the roughness of both script and speech, Dunn perhaps alludes to his own emotional state, testimony to his strength of feeling, and similarly, when writing to the Countess, the coarseness of his writing perhaps indicates the closeness between them. Of course, letters often contain within them apologies for their own appearance, but Dunn's description of his own handwriting here does not seem to be defensive. The similarity between the written and the spoken reassures the Countess that she's receiving a text that closely resembles the performance, encoding its oral features into the material. In describing his hands as clean as my infirmities can keep them, Dunn characteristically shifts between the spiritual and the physical, hands lightly blemished by ink from schooling, writing that akin to his soul gently marked with skin. So he acknowledges the failings of writings, writing, I know what dead carcasses are in respect of things spoken. Um, but in things of this kind, that soul which inanimates them receives depths from them. The spirit of God dictate, dictates them in the sp speaker or writer and is present in his tongue or hand, meets himself again as we meet ourselves in a glass, in the eyes and hearts of hearers and readers. And that spirit, which is ever the same to an equal and loving devotion, makes a writing and a speaking, writing and a speaking equal means to edification. So the written word is given life through the response of the reader. The surface of the written letter is likened to that of a mirror becoming a reflective surface. And sort of kind of keeping with the kind of more physical space of the lady's cabinet, I've been interested to find a few examples of um, cabinets that actually have these mirrors, such as this one from the V&A that was wrought in Antwerp, um, which has a sort of tiny little room within itself um, surrounded with mirrors that would create this kind of infinity chamber um, on an object if, if a letter was put inside it. Um, it's kind of this, this hall of mirrors with this checker, checkerboard floor and the pillars. Um, but so if a reader is unable to find life in words, it reflects their own failings, as if the spirit of God is present to this reader's eyes and heart, it cannot fail to be a means to edification. This image further links the letter to the valediction sermon in which the act of memory is played out in the language of hearing. Dunn um, writes, in my long absence and so far distance from hence, remember me as I shall do you in the ears of that God to whom the furthest east and the furthest west but the right and left ear in one of us. So Dunn has moved from a reciprocal relationship with the preacher calling out the catechism, catechism and rating the correct response from his congregation to a more humane personal request to be remembered. The request to be remembered seems to have been highly effective. We have um, more manuscript copies of this sermon than any other, um, as you can see in one of the kind of um, gems entries for the, the sermon on Ecclesiastes 12.1. I don't think quite all the um, extant copies have been added yet to, to gems. So to end, I'm kind of convinced that sermons and letters might have more in common than we might think, and that they're perhaps useful ways, um, they're kind of it's an, a new, useful analogy to think about sermons with. Diane Mitchell and Gary Schneider have both written the trope of Erasmus's characterization of letters as conversations between friends was a conceit more effective of cultural preference in, for in-person communication than it is of the day-to-day -day operation of Renaissance correspondence. Indeed, um, as Mitchell has discussed, if nodding, touching, smiling, laughing, embracing, browing, and performing other interpersonal cues are all impossible in the space of a letter, um, the letter's epistemological differences from embodiment and speech nonetheless gave them a value of all their own. 
So sermon texts, both printed and manuscript, are of interest in their own relationship to and divergence in speech. 17th century preachers relied upon a notion that their voice, particularly their voices, were sacred. In the prefatory letter to Hall's funeral sermon, John Whitefoot apologies, apologizes sorry, the short representation of him as the common disadvantage of all writings, which are but the dead shadows of the living voice, and therefore no marvel. If this wants much of that great little grace and vivacity, which might seem to have been in delivery. So, are spoken words by definition lively? Um, with, um, writing its dark mirror image. I have here um, one of the sort of few resisting holograph um, done manuscripts of sermon for Gunpowder Day. Um, by considering sermons as part of a wider literary culture, as they appear in both manuscript and um, print, the delicatry or explanatory, explanatory, explanatory sorry, letters with poems, with guides to reading pulled together by their scribes, we begin to see how these dark mirrors were enlivened, how the written text could be animated, how monuments could become sweet words. So thank you, um, and thank you so much if you've um, listened to this, watched this recording. Um, I would be really um, happy to hear any thoughts that you do have. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And again, my apologies to the GEMS team um, for this, that this, this is, a, is a recording. I feel like I should have done my kind of own apology here, um, like, a, like, like, like a preacher for, um, for printing a sermon. Um, but alas, I have not. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Catherine, for that engaging lecture about some of the texts that can be found alongside manuscript sermons. It was really fascinating to hear how readers and hearers use some of their original poetry to reflect on sermons, to summarize them, and to engage with them in various ways. It was also very interesting to hear how preachers used letters accompanying their manuscript sermons to talk about the purpose of sermons, sacred spaces, and try to frame others' engagement with their sermons and to enliven their words, um, particularly exploring some of the relationships between oral and literate culture. Now, it's unfortunate that we weren't able to do a live discussion with Catherine. Um, I'm sure that would have been really fascinating. Um, but as Catherine said, you can email her with any questions or comments. Her email address once again is catherine.evans at manchester.ac.uk. Um, or you could also send any questions or comments to us at GEMS either with our email or through social media and we can pass those along to her. The next GEMS virtual lecture um, will be on October 18th at the same time as this one. And Anne Hughes will be joining us to talk about um, Puritan Preachers and London Merchants, the sermon manuscripts of Walter Boothby and John Harper from 16, the 1620s to the 1660s. Um, we hope you can join us. You can register for it on Eventbrite. Um, and we hope to see you there. Thank you.